Welcome everyone to Rules Explained. Uh, in this episode, we are going to be going over Rogue Trader. Uh, we're at the end of, of our actual rules section of it, and we're just going to be kind of going over the book and what's you know, the remaining 200 something pages. We're just, we are just going to kind of browse through it and comment on it as we go, because there's a lot of really good stuff in here. But as always, I'm John Merritt. I'm Rob Nothing. And we have a special guest star, actually. Uh, the infamous Sean Peebles, in his own words, has an obnoxiously big knowledge of Warhammer, which he is going to share with us. Hello, my name is Sean Peebles, the obnoxious so, person himself. Who knows an obnoxious amount of Warhammer 40k lore. So in this episode, like I said, we're going to go over Rogue Trader. We start off with the battle. So we've gone over the rules. We know them all. Now we get to actually play. And then, like I said, we aren't going to go into this real in depth. It's very, very informal. Um, you start off with this stuff. Start off with terrain. Terrain. <laughs> like it started at the beginning of the rules. And I just, um, I just love this because if anybody is, is, is a Warhammer 40K fan, they recognize the fact that the Games Workshop corporate beast has made all sorts of official terrain packages and all sorts of all sorts of options for you to go ahead and create wonderfully science fiction-y type terrain. And the first introduction we have to the Rogue Trader <laughs> universe is a farmhouse <laughs> surrounded by a it looks like a hedgerow. It's funny. I'm, <laughs> I'm just I'm I'm hilariously in, intrigued by this whole concept. And I yeah. just I just think it's it, it's again it, it harkens back to the old days where you threw together whatever you had, painted some models, and you just had fun. I mean, it would not would not surprise me if I saw an upside-down egg carton in the back of it, you know? But yeah, they grab a farm, a medieval farm, to put in a science fiction game. Yeah. <laughs> this, this was the time where they were encouraging people to even make their own vehicles out of anything, like the famous stick of deodorant tank. <laughs> I love this picture of the orc stabbing the human. <laughs> Well, he just looks so surprised. I don't trust oh, the orc stabbing a space marine. Oh, that may be a space marine. That may just be power armor. May not even be power armor. I got the gems brief. Wait, Pedro Cantor? Where's that? Go back. Go back up to page. Uh, the one you were just at. This one. Well, the way I was surprised is because, pe yes, that one. Pedro Cantor is a named character for the Crimson Fists. Is it? He was in he was in Rin's World, yes. What do you see that? Um, let me pull up my own copy because I didn't see a page number. Well, it's on page 64. Well, what's so fascinating about what what you what you're just saying there, Mr. Peebles, is you're on page sixty-six. We have we have here a universe that is just in its basic inception, but obviously they did not drop a shred. They found they found this to be a very a very well fertile soil, and they just let it just grow, and they just let it they they nurtured it they. They fertilized it, if I can go ahead and continue with my farm metaphor, thank you. <laughs> and I just I just find it very fascinating, and that's why I'm glad that you're here, is that you can go ahead and point out these names that I would never recognize, but yet are, are deeply entrenched in, in 40K lore. I mean, what kills New me is Rick how City. well they thought this out from the very beginning. Okay, so here's our equipment. This battle looks like it was... It was fought in Rin, uh, Rin's world, at least, which is a famous battle for the Crimson Fists. Huh. Here's our grenades. Okay, so yeah, so here's some examples of like short range, long range, you know, the plus one to hit, strength three, one damage. As we mentioned a few episodes ago, we talked about the idea that there are some very archaic weapons that are available for your troops. We know we are not considering the fact. Oh, stop there at that picture. We got to talk about that. <laughs> but we are no longer talking about a game that is simply one of science fiction combat with bolters and las guns. We are talking about the possibility 
of running into a line of skirmishers with flintlocks trying to go ahead and mow down a whole bunch of space marines who just stand there and go, what? Well, I was painting a model uh, for, for the guys on Mars. Um, who are the guys on Mars? Mechanicus. The Adeptus Mechanicus. Adeptus you Mechanicus. were probably referring to a Skitari. And I was painting a Skitari, and I noticed that he was holding a flick, you know, a flintlock, like rifle almost. It was like a really huge pistol. So, you know, I painted yes. it wood and bronze and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yes, this Here's picture. A... <laughs> what a great picture. <laughs> Look at that gun. There's a little skull on it. Look at that armor when they still wear camouflage. I love the orc at the bottom that's got like the huge knife trying to get into his legging. <laughs> For every battle honor, a thousand heroes die alone, unsung and unremembered. That's very 40k. You will not be missed. <laughs> Another I, positive message brought to you by the yeah. people at 440k. And of course, and here's the other famous melt a gun and musket and needler gun. That's an interesting oh picture. You just look at that picture and you've got, you know, it's just such a gamut of technological firepower. I mean, musket, melt a gun. Which one will you choose? Yeah. <laughs> you have a gun that superheats the air hot enough to melt tank armor next to a lead ball. A musket that then sometimes hits. A needler Funny gun. Funny enough, which... though, look at the save modifier for the musket. Minus one. Yeah. Oh, this is the one. This is the one. Look at the little lore tidbit for the musket. A primitive weapon still used on some feral and backward planets, of which Birmingham is the most well known. Oh, okay. Birmingham, aka the Black Planet, receives almost no visible light, and as a result, no one wants to go there. Its inhabitants have become linguistically and culturally isolated. Because I know in future editions, they actually drop the needle gun. They kind of changed it with the uh, a shuriken gun. The needle gun isn't actually related to the Eldar. Oh, it's not. The needle I gun is sworn it was. Separate. No, the needle gun is separate. There is actually a shuriken gun there on the next page right there. Shuriken catapult. Oh my gosh, check that out. Oh, the shuriken catapult. Nice. That's got the same range. Plus one to hit, strength four, uh, one damage. You know, it's good to know that has never changed <laughs> in the nine editions. Those stats have like never changed. Back in the 80s, there was an obsession with science fiction groups that always have a needle gun in all their games. Not exactly sure what the needle gun held, held as a fascination for many of these, these writers and designers, but my goodness, they were all over the place. It is interesting that the Shuriken Catapult was a follow weapon. You know how the F is marked? You know, you killed one, you just kept going. Right. Or a, a follow-through type, I think that's what it was. Following fire. Following fire, that's it. Right. Here's a very oh, archaic Eldar. Sword. Oh, the chainsword, the iconic weapon. Yes, I don't know if I'm going a bit too fast. I think I am. Yeah, we're on uh, 675. Close combat weapons, there's and some there plasma we go gun. Again. Take your choice. Do you want a plasma gun, <laughs> an auto pistol, or a sling? Hmm. I love it. I actually, this is not, this is, this is, this is love speaking right now. I have no problem with any of this. I'm just absolutely fascinated with this game. I always will be. If you go look at one of the more modern um, role playing game books called Dark Heresy made by Fantasy Flight, you see the same type of technological uh, disparity. You have bolters sitting right next to a flintlock musket. I love this one. Well, you weren't able to go ahead and hear some of our original conversations, but just to, just to go ahead and bring you up to speed a, a little bit, this Rogue Trader game was considered to be a hybrid, a, a kind of missing link, I, I would be another way to phrase it, between role-playing games and the traditional miniatures games that we understand now with 40K and, and uh, Age of Sigmar and so on and so forth. This, this had elements of all of those, but then by second and third and fourth editions, they continually went ahead and made it more of a miniatures tabletop game rather than a role-playing tabletop option. 
Mm -hmm. So there's the power sword, close combat, strength five. This is interesting how they give us, you know, a minimum strength value basically of a five. So like even my little would be Eldar who have a strength of three, where in modern ones, where in modern editions of the game, you know, the damage of the melee weapons solely based on the weapon. Excuse me, where the damage, where the strength value is solely based upon the individual strength. This gives you a minimum strength. I think John and I, that harkens back and reminds me of an argument that we went through for about half an hour considering the strength of the user and whether or not it makes any difference if you have a lightsaber. It was a fun debate. <laughs> the stub gun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in case Philip Marlowe shows up on your battlefield. <laughs> There's the power glove. Yes, the power glove looking like a, one of those gaming gloves. The power glove. Where's the stats for that? I think that's on like the next page. I love that picture. Rogue trader. Trace the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian. Oh my gosh, that is. <laughs> But the power gloves, so easy. Sword, some gun, sawed off shotgun, web gun. Power glaive. Power glove. Power gloves are consistent of a metal gauntlet surrounded by a powerful energy field. Power gloves are blah, blah, blah. Stats. Close combat strength, eight. Holy cow. <laughs> One damage. Safe modifier, minus five. Close combat. Wow. That thing is almost always going to be doing one point of damage. What was fun about that is I, I, I at one time had um, a hero unit, a champion, I believe it was, who just liked to go ahead and jump on the tanks and just start ripping them apart with his with his power glove, like peeling back a sardine can. He would have been, he would eventually get shot off. It was just kind of fun to watch him, you know, terrify a armored vehicle for a few rounds. Heavy plasma gun, heavy bolter. I love the rocket launcher. That is the coolest rocket launcher ever. I love how the heavy bolt, the over over the shoulder heavy bolter. Yeah. Which I still think they they came back with that. No, no, they did not. They oh, they came back with the the rocket launcher. If you look at the Horus Heresy models, they have the over the shoulder heavy uh, missile launcher. Hmm. The heavy stubber. That's just a German machine gun. Oh, yes. We have the weapons, the heavy weapons, and now we have the very heavy weapons. Whoa. Once again, because <laughs> oh this God. game was assuming you could play all sorts of different scenarios, including ones involving prepared emplacements, and so on and so forth. Macro cannon. Plasma cannon. The macro cannon. Good lord. Short range, 0 to 20 inch. Long range, C text. <laughs> It shoots over to the next table. <laughs> Strength 10, damage 2d10. Wow. <laughs> Save on fire, minus six. Yeah, look at that. Range is 72 inches. Strength 8, damage 10 plus d10. That's what we call a hurt. Just a little. Um, I have never seen that Eldar unit. I mean, they remind me of Eldars, but I've never seen that unit ever anywhere. That, well, that's the, that's the famous wings. Tinkerbell squadron, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a break off of the uh, of that one unit. Swooping Hawks? Could be. Uh, to me, they look like Eldar Corsairs, which had models for a while before Vorge World discontinued them. These are the different grenades. Various psychological grenades, which I thought were interesting. The anti-plant grenade. Psych out. Blind choke gas. Hallucinogen grenade. It's a very famous one. I like that picture. <laughs> Oh, the mines. Because you could have a minefield in here if you wanted to. Or is this the wrong kind of mines that I'm thinking of? 
No, it's just the right kind, including Land a mines. choking vine minefield, which, there you go, yeah. there's an anti-plant grenade. Yep. Definitely. The uh, vortex grenade. Well, yes. When I saw this, the weapon summary table, and I thought, oh my God, do they have a lot of weapons? But, you know, this is every single army, every single weapon, everything you need, one book. Yeah. No, no codexes, no indexes, no special army list. They did have a few supplements after this game um, called, which people would recognize that they use the word chapter approved, and they would be expansion rules. They, they modified the vehicle rules, which would then be, would be rolled into the second edition of the game. Uh, and they did have a, a supplement, I believe it was called Here We Go. And just because of the way I pronounced it, you can probably tell it was a supplement about orcs. Uh, there we go, here we go. The sand crawler. Oh yeah, now, now the vehicles come into play. There's some really, really cool concepts. Just vehicles all over the place. And what's interesting is if oh, you were gosh, a sand that picture. Or, Jump jets. <laughs> if you were, a, you know, those, that's a fight pack, isn't it? I mean, wouldn't that be considered a fight pack? I mean, they basically they basically have Pratt and Windy tur Pratt and Whitney turbine engines on the back. No kidding. Hovers. Famous orcs, juggernauts, landing pods. Oh gosh, that's a dreadnought. Yep, landing pods have been there since the uh, a get go. I thought it was interesting to see oh, that, that little picture right there. On the bottom right. Uh huh. Oh, with the dread that is a, through the wall. That is a dreadnought. Yes. And uh, each army had a dreadnought. Hmm. Now, for those of you who are wondering what it would be like to fight a battle inside of uh, your family car, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we have a picture of it, and we probably have stats for it. Yeah, the stats were right on the top of the page. City car. And we're still on the battle at the farm. Um, cool drawing of the. Uh... I think that's a typo. You think so? Well, they're definitely in the equipment section, and suddenly they go ahead and have. The battle at the farm? Yeah. <laughs> Holy moly. I've had this game for like, you know, 40 some odd years or whatever it is, 30 years. I've never noticed that before. That's hilarious. Crazy. And here is the fa all famous landmark, the Land Raider, straight out of the World War One. World War One, Mark Five. Every single army could have a Land Raider. A trench tank. Didn't matter if you were a Space Marine or not. Yep. Here's a trench tank. Maximum speed twenty, acceleration seven. Oh, uh, ten capacity. Eight toughness, thirty damage. Save on a five or six, which is interesting because the modern land raiders have, you know, like a two plus save. It's three equipment points and five willpower. Hmm. Now we had our walkers. It's the different armor types. The here, here, tank. Here's the one I really like. Is the Space Marine armor torn apart? Because I was always curious about the backpack. You know, armored solar panels. <laughs> Reserve air bottles. Stabilizing jets. Air purifier. Temperature regulator. If you look on the, in the spine area, they have nerve electrodes <laughs> that like go into the body. To inject it with adrenaline, food and drugs. And to be honest with you, I don't ever believe that uh, until maybe the modern versions of, of the 40k game, they never did the Space Marine justice as far as its capabilities, as far as its uh, strength, the, the strength of the space armor or the Space Marine armor, I should say, the the training, the whole uh, fiction and narrative that goes behind these guys and their surgical procedures they undergo. I don't oh, ever yeah. believe that they, they really captured the flavor of that until relatively recently, I think. 
Yeah, yeah. Because they really should, you should really, in my opinion, here, here's the really quick way to summarize what should be happening. Terminator, that should be a regular space marine as far as the armor and the toughness and the difficulty of killing. That should be a regular space marine stat. And if you're going to have Terminator army, that should be even, that should be practically a, a hybrid dreadnought thing. I just, I just never, when you read the fiction, when you read the narrative, it just never made any sense to me that we then go back to the stats and we see that a space marine has a toughness of four and a save of, of four, or should say, yeah, four, five, three. or six. No, three, actually. Uh, a space marine saves on a three plus. In which edition? Well, um, almost all of them. Because? I mean, except this edition, but... yes. I, I mean, I know since like version at least seven and above, because I think that's where we came. Because in this edition is four, five, or six. You have to right. go ahead and wear another. You have to wear another layer of armor and slow down your movement rate to go ahead and get the four, five, or six. Yeah, I'm it's, three, four, five, or six. Yeah, Space Marines have a three plus save. A Terminator has a two plus save. Here's where Frank Herbert gets his two cents worth in. They got energy fields in there. And... That's funny because I'm actually it's a... doing right now. In, in response to a space frame being shown off just where they keep in mind, this is the same setting where if they go up against the right thing, they will be fighting something that is faster than them and shooting a black hole at them. Armor can't stop. That is much true. In terms of that. Here's the age of the Imperium. That's a very Imperial photo. Very much so. So how much has changed in the Imperium? The galaxy, warp space. They talk about warp drives. I mean, Sean, have you read anywhere else where they talk about warp drives and warp gates? Warp drives and warp gates? Not too much. Not in this detail, other than just the Black Library books themselves. Most of uh, the rule books will just give you a, a small one or two paragraphs uh, explaining how they get, aro get around. Or creatures. The human navigator. Humanity in the Imperium. We're a bunch of nice guys. <laughs> Imperium hierarchy. Over 10,000 years ago, the, in bolded letters, Great Emperor of Mankind, unbolded, ascended to the golden throne of Earth. They call it Earth. Not Terra? Nope. Oh, look at this. We got the Adeptus Terra. We have the Adeptus Custodes, the Emperor's Inner Guard. The Adeptus Mechanicus, also known as Tech Priest. The Adeptus... Arbitus. In uh in this in the photo up there you actually see a custodian guard. He's on the right center. This guy? If you it look at the like photo. The photo. What page? The the same one. Alright. The Imperial hierarchy. You have the photo in the middle of the screen. Uh-huh. Oh, on the far right. Yes. Because there's four different people on here. Yes, the guy with the uh, bunny-eared hat. Okay. And here's the rogue traders, the imperial fleet, death worlds, feral worlds, hive worlds. I mean, what amazes me is from the beginning, this was all here, and then here's the emperor. Well, for those fans of Necromunda, obviously, you go oh. ahead and really want to read up on the origins of Hive World. Oh, and then we see this picture underneath the Emperor, where we have two custodians and what looks like a navigator or an astropath. Wow, you, wow, I would not have guessed that. That's cool. Yep, those are custodians. Emperor? <laughs> What's left no, of them? a custodian. <laughs> that is not a custodian. Oh. That's no, that no, yes, that is one of the pictures of the emperor in this book. Barely alive. There's another really good picture of the emperor in here. I do not know what page. What's 
Symbol is that on their chest? Dark angels? Those are, yes, dark angels. If the dark, yes, the dark angels were a thing at this point. They had their, uh, their black armor. Ah, oh, yes, if you wanted to play as a, a Custodes, a Mechanicus, an Arbides. Oh, a low-level Adeptus Custodes. Wow. Because they were weak. <laughs> Age of the Imperium. The Inquisition. <laughs> what a show. Oh, or, oh yes, yeah, it's, it's the greatest Inquisitor ever. Their motto, innocence proves nothing. The, uh, the Inquisitor for the photo, it's like Obi, it's Obi Wan Sherlock Clouseau, I believe his name was. <laughs> you know his name? On page 143. Yes, I know his name. On 43. Because his name is amazing. On 43. Okay, are you talking to. Um, okay, PF page 143. Yes. With PDF the beard, with the hat, with the uh, Atachi symbol in the middle. Yes, that's Obi Wan. Oh my god! I dropped my phone. So his name's We're what? fine. His name is Obi Wan Sherlock Clouseau. <laughs> that was his Strange name. Choice on the Clouseau. <laughs> so here we have the hierarchy: the Emperor, the Master of the Inquisition, and the Inquisition's agents. And then there's everybody else. Everyone else who's on board. Wow. Yes, here we go. A typical Inquisitor is represented here by the renowned Obi-Wan Sherlock Clusio, a tireless exposer of psychic misdeeds and genetic deviance. Here we have psychers. This is where you could roll up all your characters. There's a neat part here where I don't know if you got into this to this point that's unique to Rogue Trader. What's that? It doesn't show up again. It's the um, the Star Child. There's a fragment of the Emperor that's exploring. Well, I don't know if it's exploring, but it lives in the warp. Mm -hmm. And you could <clears throat> you could play as this uh, this thing called a Sensei, which is a biological uh, child of the Emperor. So here we have the actual Space Marines, the Age of the Imperium. The, the Legion Emperor, of Astartes. Chapter leaders, Imperial commanders. Go back to that picture there. This one? There's the uh, service markings on that guy's forehead. I thought like each rivet or stud was like for every 10 years of service or something. Every 100 years. Oh, it's 100 years. Wow. I also quite like the, uh, on page 157, we see all like the very notable chapters of the Adeptus Astartes. Yeah, you see Blood Space Angels, yeah. Crimson Fists, the Dark Angels, and then, you know, there's the Rainbow Warriors, the Silver Skulls, the Blood Drinkers. Suffice to say, is this what you were expecting, or is it pretty much what it should have been, this edition, this original edition of Warhammer 40,000? I think the history and the lore and the world that they created, I mean, that's really what Games Workshop was fantastic at doing, was they created this universe. You know, J.K. Rowling created the a Harry Potter world, you know. Um, you know, the guy who made Star Wars made this universe, you know, in which you know, the and, guy who made Star Wars, yeah, George sorry. Lucas, <laughs> George Lucas, thank you, <laughs> you know, created this universe in which stories could be told. And that's one thing Games Workshop just did beautifully was they created this universe in which stories could be told. And then, oh, by the way, we have this game called Rogue Trader, where you can actually play out, you know, a character in this world. Warhammer 40k is always at its best when you look at it as a setting rather than a story. 
Hmm. More imperial. A lot of imperium. It's kind Which of big. Is one of my biggest complaints about later editions of 40K is that it limits the story. It takes it down and narrows it down to just a few races with the perpetual war. And I get the whole perpetual war concept. I'm not saying that that is not what 40K should be doing. There's the space but legion. What you have is you have this, this, this universe that was so rich and they watered it down to something that is, that is not really as, as, as in depth and not really as, as colorful as it once was. When you get to page 173, I want to make a note. Right. And PDF page 173. Got it. I mean, Which right now they have right here. so many different, actually, right now they have so many different stuff out there that uh, I think you're right. They've, they've really kind of stretched themselves thin some. You know, the less armies they have, the more they can focus on story. You know, because time is finite and they can only do so much with what they have. Uh, they have a lot of armies out there. But yeah, the storyline itself has kind of been watered down. What do you think, Sean, about the actual storyline? I don't know, because with with what with what they did with eighth edition, they did something they haven't really done for a long while. They actually expanded the storyline. To what? With the destruction of Cadia, the emergence of the rift, they've kind of shaken the setting. So nothing it really is... changed until up until eighth edition. Yeah, for the most part, yes. What role do the squats play in that? The squats are actually making a comeback. Um, they have a couple Forge World models. Other than being eaten by Tyranids, I believe it's actually shown that a couple of them are still around fighting. I don't know. They brought back a Zote, so I have no doubt they might bring back more squats. Well, that's encouraging because that was basically my point, is that we see here uh, maybe an attempt by Games Workshop to bring the universe back to its, its rich tapestry, as a phrase I used before. And I think here we have another picture of the emperor. That's yes, the this one is I what I wanted for. to uh, bring up. <laughs> this is the other remember, picture of the emperor. If you remember I last week, a... I was trying to show this to you, and I finally found it, and I sent an email to you. But yeah, that, that's the other one. That's I'm not exactly sure. The other one, like I said, is very H.R. Giger. This one is just more or less, you know, here's a guy in very advanced stages of, I've been in the hospital too long. <laughs> Of decay, yeah. Basically, this is like a, 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 this could be a picture of like what the emperor probably does look like He's on death's door. You have a I, group of people walking I mean, up to the throne. Thought he was basically on ready like a to golden be sacrificed. Throne, you know, barely kept That's alive. That's what the propaganda says. You know, a thousand souls are slaughtered per day to keep him alive. We don't know what the golden throne really looks like. Wait, we've seen this picture before. Yes, there's a lot. They reuse pictures. <laughs> We're on a budget. Earlier in the book, or, earlier in the book, I noticed they used the same, the same picture on um, oh, one here page, and then you flip the page, and it's the same picture again. Okay, so here's abhumans, and here's beastmen, halflings. Here's the squats. <laughs> Homo sapiens minimus. <laughs> Homo sapiens rotundus. Squats. <laughs> Rotundus. <laughs> it's like, yep, What's that's interesting them. interesting is if you think about it, because remember, this is supposed to be the Imperium of Man, the Imperium of the human race. They basically have, through the fiction, suggested that all these races are just simply genetic offshoots of humanity. Every one of them. The Ogrens, the, the uh, Squats, they, if you look back at their names, they're all basically genetically differentiated human beings. And here we have your Squats. Uh, the Eldar race and the Craft Worlds. And they have pictures of Squats. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I honestly wonder if that is supposed to be their 
you know, the, the small clip that says the Eldar race and the craft world as it is surrounded by, you know, pictures of squats. I, I wonder if they actually meant to put that there or if they did, if they <laughs> just didn't have any pictures and they had to fill the page up with something. Now, here's the first race that they've listed that's not human where they actually have like a real history behind it, it looks like. I do love the painting back then, or the painting style. I mean, it's so much different nowadays versus back then. I uh, I dare you to take this color scheme and put it on a, on a uh, modern Eldar. Oh, I would totally do that. You should. <laughs> People do it but with uh, ultramarines all the time. Models back then were made of what, lead? <laughs> Pewter. Well, no, well it, actually, no, it, was, it was lead. lead. Yeah. Yeah, they, they switched yeah, over. Oh, yeah, yeah. More it was lead than pewter than because plastic. Because of the various regulations that were put out. But they also had a wide range, a much wider range, I think, even than today. And I can't back that up with any um, objective facts, but there was a wide range of plastic miniatures that were available as well. Yeah, the plastic ones, they were able to really put the details in. I mean, the advantage about having the metal ones was if you didn't like them, you can get some paint stripper and a toothbrush and, you know, clean it all off and repaint it. Uh, it's much more difficult to do that with the plastic model. But the plastic model's details were just beautiful. It wasn't bad. It obviously was not as advantageous as lead. That's why lead was such a popular uh, medium for, for miniatures is because when, when it was in its melting point, it flowed very neatly and evenly into the molds and as a result you get these wonderfully detailed miniatures anything from civil war through world war ii all the way up to you know 40k mm -hmm. but suffice to say you know there was a fairly significant downside to lead and then uh plastic um had a, another advantage and it was much easier to customize you know if i wanted to chop some pieces off and just reattach them i was much easier than needing to get out the soldering iron and try to reattach something to a yeah, a lead figure. Is this our uh, Adeptus Mechanicus? Yeah, that's the red robes. It just kills me that they had all this stuff, you know, from thirty years ago, and it's still used today. I, I, I just think that's so cool. Most of it, not all of it. Some of it. The ancient land and their inheritance. When lizard men were a playable faction. Again, the That's whole true. concept of watering down the universe. Jacaro. Funny enough, with the with the slan, at least, um, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe they kind of turned into the old ones, where the Eldar, the old ones, that the Necrons and the Orcs fought. Oh, space wolves. In the uh, the first War of Heaven, where they put the flag up. Yeah, what most people don't realize is that the Space Marines actually liberated Iwo Jima. <laughs> We've got a picture right here of it. <laughs> it's right here, guys. It's early Space Force. <laughs> it was the Space Wolves. Tyranids and the High Fleet. Yeah, they had the Tyranids. I went to um, was it a, a game stay was it a game stay here around was it here around town and i got to see some models painted by the heavy metal team and they had some tyranids there my jaw dropped i mean they look like they had flesh on it shiny fleshy reptilian i don't know how these masters did it i i, I swear i think they ripped apart an actual animal and like you know put it around the actual model it looks so beautiful and then charge forty five dollars for it. Oh, pfft. that's just for the model. If you want it painted, that's extra. Zotes, uh, warp creatures, astral hounds. There's vampires. Giant mosquitoes. And we passed the enslavers, but I also wanted to make a note of them because they also show up in the uh, later lore. Do they really? As yes, they were 
they showed up after the first war in heaven when the Necrons went went uh, yeah, past it. into their great sleep. They kind uh -huh. of showed up out of the warp. They're not enslavers. demons, but they're on the enslavers are on page PDF page two hundred and five. Yep, got it. They Even were six. Uh, wow. They kind of just came up and showed. They showed up to start like ravaging the galaxy, basically. They killed off most of the whatever was left of the the old ones, and I, I believe the Eldar got a handle on them. Contained well, I mean, them. One thing I have not seen yet is you know the big bad so-called as if there is a bad guy in this universe because there's no good guys. Is chaos. I have not seen anything related to chaos. Just hinted at yeah, in the earlier part where they talked about the chaos storms, the warp storms, they? I should say. There was hints about it, but you're right. There, I don't think there. I don't remember any actual stats. Yeah, if like I remember corn, correctly, I believe chaos is actually shows up in like second edition. Yes. Giant insectoids, gene stealers. Gene stealers uh, aren't tyranids in Rogue Trader. Yeah, we were talking about that a couple episodes ago is that they they merged them with the Gene Steelers and I can't even begin to tell you what edition they did that in. Do you know off the top of your head? I nope. do not. Creature. A Tora squirrel. A rippy fish. Floaters. I guess fungus. So it looks like here we moved into just the animals. Oh, here's the Death Worlds. What is a Death World? Great question. For starters, there are many different sorts. No two Death Worlds are the same. But they all have one thing in common. They are dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, what is a Death World? Anyone know? Other, other than the fact that it's dangerous. Are you asking? In general. These are planets that, that had run amok, you know, ec ecologically run amok. There are, there are plants that are eating you. There are animals that are eating you. There are, the very atmosphere itself is, is dangerous. I played a couple of uh, games where, in which we had death worlds. And it was kind of interesting because you'd be trying to advance your troops and you, know, you lose one because it got sucked up by some sort of carnivorous quicksand or whatever. It just, they were just bizarro situations. And you wouldn't want to play them regularly, but they were just kind of fun now and again. Ah, yes, planets where everything there wants to kill you. Two famous ones, including Katachan and Krieg. And Australia. And Australia. Well, that's just Katachan. Oh, I love this picture of the space marine. I, I, I just screams. Next to the <laughs> <laughs> He's got the visor over his, face, his eyes. Uh, yes, because everyone wants a, a cable plugged directly into your brain. Now that's some virtual reality. <laughs> This is where they start talking about some of those worlds that get isolated for a short period of time by warp storms. Yes, the um, the one they bring up is actually located inside the Eye of Terror that they can only really get to every like 10 years. When the Eye of Terror blinks. Ships fly between the lost worlds of the rest of the galaxy and the rest of the galaxy. Minor ships. Wow. And again, getting back this... to what we were talking about before we started, the whole Warhammer fantasy universe, uh, fantasy world, I should say, has been postulated, and rightly so, as being one of those warp isolated worlds. The gamer. <laughs> the advanced gamer. The gamer. This is kind of interesting. There's, there's a lot of interesting, nice rules in here to go ahead and, and make it, make the game a little bit more tactical as well as add some nuances to it. Personalities as targets. Hmm. Scenery, insanity, hidden movements. Yeah, that's a, yeah, always an interesting one because I mean, if you're in terrain and you want to move without letting your other person know, how, how do you do that? That's what the Game Master's for. And in fact, that was a big part of, of Wargaming before 40K, and we talked about this too when we first started this whole program, is that 
you know, the, the referee, one of the referee's job was to monitor hidden movement, whether or not you were uh, doing some tunneling, which they called mining during the uh, Middle Ages, or if you were just trying to outflank your opponent and you, you could not see him uh, because they were around the ridge. So yeah, there was an awful big need for people to have their own maps so you could do these secret moves. Injury chart. That's pretty cool. There's a, there's a little interesting little uh, quote tidbit on page 236. It says, the, it says, though my guards may sleep and ships may lie at anchor, our foes know full well that big guns never tire, uh, attributed to the tyrant of Badab. This little thing would later be expanded into the Astral Clause, the Badab War, Luft Huron, which is a chaos named character. Hmm. I didn't know that. It's mentioned in the uh, Chaos Codex. Keeping the, the narrative going. So, I mean, they put in the whole history of this. How much of this has changed? So you said the history and the storylines. Because, you know, I once asked Sean, I said, where are the books? Where's the lore? Where's the stories? He said, by the codexes. They're in there. And I went, oh, that, well, that makes sense. You know, but they also have the Black Library. So... And I think they're coming out with a whole bunch of new books, aren't they? Black Library? They're always yeah. coming out with books, but yes. Um, they recently announced a, a collection of of new stories, and one of my friends just picked up the new book about Luther. Plot generator. I love it. This These are fun. I just, can, can someone roll like a 1D100? I'm going to roll a 1D100. All right. So I rolled a 50. Of course, the plot generate. Uh -huh. Go on. Yeah, the scattered homesteaders of a newly settled farming world are not getting on too well. There's a, only one bar, and it is the scene of constant brawling as the Joneses argue with the Smiths over whose turn it is to use the auto plow. And the Brock bring. Brangwins bicker with the Jamesons over who makes the best yam scotch. <laughs> the surplus of yam scotch is not helping matters. The Brangwins, hoping to finish their competitors, have recently wrecked the Jameson stills. The Jamesons are out for revenge and have hatched a cunning plot to poison the algae of the Brang sewer sewage plants. It and that's just like easy. one of the player motives, because it looks like with this, you roll 1d100 to find the motive. And then you roll another 1d100. Well, that's that enough for me to go more. to war. <laughs> Again, suggesting quite to my point that the universe and the possibilities were tenfold what they were in later editions of the game. I'd argue that these... um. These things, at least, are still there in spirit, but not necessarily in text. When was the last time you saw a battle which had two rival, essentially moonshining clans fighting over their, their rum-running rights? I, I've never seen that in any other edition of 40K. You're right, which is why I said in spirit. You can always make your own battle. And write it out, and it will fit the setting. Oh, collecting and painting your forces. And the fascinating thing is, is that these were spelled out. The, these whole scenarios, these, these ideas, these, these, these creative spurts of the imagination were all there waiting for you to go ahead and create this complex web of storytelling that was punctuated by these intense battles. I just, I just thought that this was, again, I'm gonna keep saying it, I'm gonna keep making sure that my point is heard loud and clear, that nothing like this has ever been tried again. Look at these old original Citadel paints. Oh boy. Wow. 
I, I wonder at what point they changed the, f the, f the form factor of the pot from that to what we see today. The what? Well, the form factor of the original paint pot. Oh. It's just this bottle where now it's kind of shorter. It's almost like cauldronish. And of course, the more modern paint bottles use a, a almost a, a teardropper almost to it, which is really nice. There's the different brushes. No, here's how to a paint them. A common factor of all Games Workshop games is a painting guide. Of uh, yep. It's kind of cool. Which I promptly ignored when I made my first Space Marine. Soldier. Black lining, shading, <laughs> highlighting, washing. Would you like chart. to hear my story about my first Warhammer 40K squad that I painted? Yeah. Step one, assemble plastic models. Step two, white spray paint. Step three, black highlights. Step four, done. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Step four, gold highlights. Step five, done. Wow. <laughs> and I still have those guys. That's cool. I think I still have the old original Eldar as well. I know you have some of the original Harlequins. I do. The original crew, it looks like. I think so. These are probably the guys who put it all together. Yes, those are all illustrations of the of the staff and the writers and illustrators for this game. I am. So am I. <laughs> Bitter man. <laughs> Bitter men. It looks like here they just kind of added a summary. Now we're at the summary. The cheat sheets. Oh, these are nice. Definitely have to print these out. Yeah, those are actually pretty cool. All right, guys, I think that takes us about to the end of it. Just real quick, that last section there, the author's note on the technology gave you a little insight as far as how the future operated and what the future had in store during the, the age of the Imperium. And it lifted the game again beyond just a simple, let's fight a bunch of battles and said, hey, this is what you're fighting and this is the environment you're fighting. These are the technologies you can expect to find and really inspired you to create these, these stories surrounding these wars. Oh, here's some templates you can copy and print out and cut. So you enjoy the games that allow you to create other things. Yes. The minute that they started telling me in 40K that minute some other people were telling me, well, you can't have that unit, you can't have that. I was like, why? And then they say, well, it's not in the rules or it's not in the codex or whatever. And I was like, well... I'm going to just postulate that the galaxy is much bigger than one codex can possibly explain. I've heard the galaxy is pretty big. It's relatively be, large. You'd be right in that context. I mean, the, the best way I think I've heard the galaxy explained in size is think of the biggest thing you can think of. It's bigger than that. I think uh, yeah. a guy by the name of Douglas Adams wrote that. Douglas Adams is a great philosopher. He was. All right, guys, is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I'm good. All right, guys. I'm all right. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, thanks for listening. Well, Again, you can find our podcast on iTunes, Spotify. Uh, we're on YouTube. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at rulesexplained at gmail.com. Thanks a lot, guys. Adios. Bye.